Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Brian Hansen and I'm the Associate Director of the Buffett Center for International and Comparative Studies and I want to welcome you here for this talk today. It's great to see such a robust turnout given the perfect uh, fall day that we have outside. I understand why people are here. We have the great fortune of having with us today Tariq Ramadan, who's a professor of Islamic studies on the Faculty of Theology at Oxford University. He's also a senior research fellow at St. Anthony's College um, and also at uh, Doshisha University in Kyoto, Japan. And he's the president of the think tank of um, European Muslim Network located in Brussels. Um, Professor Ramadan has studied uh, philosophy, French literature, holds a PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Geneva. And through his scholarship and his, his public uh, appearances and public speaking, he's really become recognized as a leading Islamic thinker uh, in the West. He's an active participant in such important debates as uh, the position and role of Muslims in Western societies, as well as within uh, Muslim-majority countries. He's a prolific writer with a very large opus. Many of you probably know his works. They include, among others, Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics, and Liberation, In the Footsteps of the Prophet, Lessons from the Life of Muhammad, Western Muslims and the Future of Islam, and Islam, the West, and the Challenge of Modernity. And beyond the scholarly realm, of course, um, Professor Ramadan is a very influential public intellectual, someone to whom large numbers of people turn uh, for insights on issues as diverse as globalization and Islamic texts, unemployment in France to women's rights, social justice to dialogue, on, uh, dialogue between civilizations. He's earned a great deal of public recognition for um, his role as a public inter, uh, intellectual, including Time Magazine, naming him um, uh, one of the most important innovators of the 20th century. And it also, as we all know, um, Professor Ramadan has been, um, uh, has been the subject of a great deal of controversy, most visibly in this country back in 2004, when the Bush administration denied him a visa to come and accept a position at Notre Dame University. Um, and that decision was appealed over the years unsuccessfully until just recent, recently, earlier this year, um, the ban was lifted by Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, much of the controversy around Professor Ramadan actually swirls around this question about what he believes. It's hard to think of a public intellectual um, uh, for whom there is such a hotly contested debate about what he really and truly believes. Um, perhaps in that context, he recently uh, has published a book that's simply titled what I believe. And today he's going to talk to us about this book, which is available in the back of the room, and he will be around at the end of the talk to, to uh, sign books as well. But it's my great pleasure to welcome Tariq Ramadan here to Northwestern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this introduction, uh, Professor, and, and thank you for this invitation here. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Yes. So um, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Before I was banned from the country, I came once here uh, in this university to meet with some students who were, in fact, uh, studying French, French literature, and I came and I was invited to, to, to speak about uh, uh, the reality and the situation in France today. Uh, I'm, I'm here, I will uh, just share with you some uh, uh, views and thoughts about our situation uh, in the West. And in fact, exactly uh, the title of the book, What I Believe. Just to let you know where uh, did it come from. In fact, uh, I published many books, a series of books on the situation of Muslim, Muslim majority countries, a series uh, of books on, on the situation in the West, uh, and some of them are academic books, and an Italian publisher told me, the people are not going to read, they are not reading your big books, your thick books, just do something very small, uh, which is useful for the people who are in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> 
and it might be you. Uh, we were also thinking about some journalists that sometimes are coming and they don't, uh, ha they don't have time to read. So uh, a, a simple book, but uh, tackling a, a very complex issue. And very complex issues, in fact, because there are many fields and many dimensions that I'm trying to tackle in the book. So I will uh, say something about the book and also about uh, some of the uh, the challenges that we are facing today, uh, not only as Western Muslims, as I put it, but also as Westerners living together in pluralistic society. Coming to the States uh, uh, after a few years, uh, my sense, and this was six months ago, is that what we are experiencing in, the, in Europe was not going to happen in the States, in fact. Uh, you know and you can uh, hear from European countries that there are populist trends and populist parties that are gaining ground. You heard, of course, about uh, the Netherlands with Get Wilders comparing the Koran to Mein Kampf of Hitler, and he's the leading force in uh, the political, fo the leading political force and the movement that he's leading because he has no party uh, in the Netherlands. In my country, the Swiss People Party, they were uh, pushing for a referendum against the construction of the minarets and they won against all the expectations. I myself wasn't uh, uh, um, expecting them to win and they themselves didn't. The, the, the very night of the results, they were surprised that it went through. Uh, and this is what we have throughout the European countries. And over the last few months in the States, what we have uh, heard is something which is a bit worrying because I, I didn't expect this to happen here with all this discussion around the community center in New York and then the uh, burning a Koran day in Florida we heard voices in the states that's exactly similar to what we are uh, facing in Europe Islamization of America, uh, imposition of Sharia, it's a silent colonization, uh, Islam is the threat. So we have this happening here. So we are facing common challenges with different narratives and different situations that we have to understand, uh, but still uh, also understanding what is happening with this shift in the whole discourse that we have now in the West. So it's quite important to get that and to understand in order to uh, come together. Once again, my position on all this is not to respond to all these problems as Muslims facing something which is an anti-Islamic uh, campaign, is as citizens and people having values and coming together. And I speak to, uh, about this in my conclusion because I, I really think that we have to, to just shift uh, the, 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 this fracture that some are trying to impose onto us between races on cultures and religions and, and making us understand that uh, our struggle is only in the name of our religion or our race or our culture while it's a struggle for justice, values and living together is something which is deeper than that and I think that we also have to understand that uh, not only sometimes our struggle are just and justify, but we also have to look at the narrative within which these struggles are put, because it might be that we are misled if we accept the upstream uh, narrative of all the discussion when people are religionizing problems or culturalizing problems the way they are doing it. So uh, let me come to, to, to some of the points that I'm raising in, in the book. Uh, I'm not going to summarize it, but some, just some of the points that I want to, 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 to tackle and, and to discuss here. I'm talking about Western Muslims, and I'm not talking about Muslims in the West. And this is the starting point of something that's happened when I, 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 I wrote a book to be a European Muslim in the 90s, the beginning of the 90s, uh, saying we have to go beyond this perception that we are Muslims living in a foreign uh, environment and to understand that this uh, cultural uh, integration, religious integration is not only uh, a hope but it is becoming a reality in many many Western countries and by saying this is really to be able to uh, translate this into a reality to be fully Muslim and fully Western at the same time so in having the, the Western culture, uh, accepting it as our culture, and then also the Islamic principles as uh, the religious framework uh, within which we are constructing our identity and our personality in the West. Uh, having said that, 
it's a, a point for me to look at the reality. Why today? And this is what you said by presenting, introducing me, uh, saying it's controversial and he, ha he went through uh, some controversies. And as I'm always putting it, it's not only my uh, work which could be understood as controversial, but today when you speak about Islam and when you tackle the, 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 the topic itself, Islam is controversial per se. So if you come and you say more than that, uh, and you are perceived as an, a Muslim intellectual, by definition you are going to face controversies in the Muslim majority countries if you are critical and in the West if you just assert the fact that yes I am a Muslim fully Muslim and at the same time I am a, a Westerner and I don't have a problem with this it might be perceived as a problem but I'm not experiencing as a problem I'm not leaving it as a, 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 a understanding my my presence in the West as something which is problematic uh, from a religious viewpoint or from uh, uh, my principles. But to get to this discussion, they are, uh, we have to understand the environment and why today there is a great deal of mistrust and in which way we can deconstruct this and, and get to a better understanding. Because the point is not only to talk, the point is to be understood and heard. And if you don't experience what I call the intellectual empathy, which is to put yourself in the shoes of the other to understand why it's problematic what you are saying. Why is it uh, uh, so difficult to hear? Why you try to be simple in the way you put it? It means that there is something which is a psychological factor, uh, which is important. And it might be that within the Muslim communities in the West today and in the Western societies, the problem is much more at the beginning a psychological problem based on a crisis, an identity crisis, and a lack of confidence than anything else at the beginning, from a Muslim viewpoint, but also from uh, what we can see uh, within uh, the, 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 the narrative and the discussion that we have in the Western societies. As I told you, I thought that this was something which was uh, mainly coming from Europe, but even in the perceived historically immigrant societies like Canada and the States, now it's coming a reality as well. What are the factors that are helping us understand uh, why there is a great deal of mistrust and uh, 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 quite a difficulty to, 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 to get what we are trying to translate? The first thing has nothing to do with Islam. It has to do with globalization. We are in a world today where our old references and universe of reference are scattered. It's not longer the same. And what was a very slow process within our societies, these changes from within the society, now it's going very fast and it's shaking our old certainties about who we are, the nation state is something which is now problematic. In Europe, the only fact that you speak about integrating the EU is problematic. Because it's bigger, for example, in my country, don't say this. Because for a Swiss nation, a small country, to think about being involved in the United, uh, in the European Union is problematic. We are losing our power, meaning we are losing our identity, we are losing our culture. So globalization is something which is a factor which is important and we are all experiencing something which has to do with uh, an identity crisis as to who we are and how we are perceiving ourselves. It's true in Canada, it's true in the United States of America, it's true in all the European countries, it's true even in Africa, it's true in all the countries. So it has nothing to do with Islam, it has to do with our time. And how do we redefine our understanding and how we deal with change? Because slow change are uh, uh, understandable, we can apprehend them in a way which is, okay, we, we get that, this is history. But when it come, becomes very quick, in the way it is now, with this new presence and the new changes and add to this the economic crisis, this is changing the whole parameters on which we were relying in our life. The second thing, which is uh, a reality as well, and more problematic in the West, but still, I'm just coming back from Qatar, uh, in the Middle East, we don't talk about this because it's perceived as a no problem, but it is a problem, it's a problem of immigration. Immigration is a very important uh, factor today, why? Because we are facing a tension and this tension in all the societies, and now it's a reality even, as I told you, in the Middle East, but in all the Western countries, is that 
with our economic need, we are in tension with our re cultural resistance. In fact, no Western country can economically survive without immigrants. And this is something which is a fact. Even the states, we all know that the United States of America needs people coming from the South. But we have rules now when we got this discussion coming from Arizona about the Latinos, but it's a reality that now immigration is becoming perceived as a problem in, in this, this country. In Canada, it's the same. It wasn't. So in Europe, it's exactly the same. There is no economic survival in Europe without immigration. And then we have policies resisting and economic needs calling the people to come. And this tension is problematic. I'm just coming from Qatar, discussing with people, and they know now in Qatar that the great, you know, the, the indigenous Qatari people are in minority. And they need people to come from Asia, from India, and at the same time, they are facing a problem because they are changing the country. We need them, but they should know what is their place. So there is a power struggle in number because the reality of you know, uh, being a citizen is not something which is discussed there because they are not becoming citizens. They are just coming to work, but numbers and changing the landscape, the social landscape is a reality everywhere. So for us today, when you are dealing with this immigration problem, uh, you will understand why some politicians and the populists are using this Islamic presence with the, the immigrant factor. Is as long as you present Islam as the religion of the other and you connect the other with the immigrant and the immigrant with the one who is going to put our identity in danger, you get the whole chain of understanding why we have to be very cautious with Muslims. It's the other silently colonizing us. And the immigrants are perceived as these foreigners coming and uh, 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 changing our society and putting us in a situation where we are in danger. So this is the second factor, which is an important one. The third one is a direct consequence of this one for the last 50 years. But now, whatever the situation, whatever the narrative that we have in our respective societies is the new visibility of Muslims. And the new visibility of Muslims is the way they dress. And of course, this is why we, have, we had in, uh, in Europe all this discussion about the headscarf, a new visibility, the minarets, the mosques, and the skin, which is also something which is important. Because uh, we, we had, for example, the far-right party, the Front National in France, saying, you know what you should do, you Muslims? If you want to be integrated, change your names. Stop calling your kids Abdurrahman or, or uh, Fatima, call them Alain, Jean-Francois, that's all fine. <laughs> I got that coming from the, the, the leading, you know, the, the, the daughters of Marie uh, Jean-Marie Jean Le Pen, which is Marine Le Pen. I say that's all fine, but what I'm going to do is my color. Not going to change. So you are playing with the symbols. But it means, in fact, that you have a problem with the presence. It's not going to work like that. So I would say here that we have a, a, a problem of this new visibility. And all these controversies about the symbols is saying something about all these fears about immigration, about our identity. Who are we? It's all focusing on symbols because behind this we have a deep crisis on how do we define ourselves. Uh, and I think that we have to take this seriously. Symbols matter, and we have to think about why it's, it works like this. Uh, not to be obsessed with symbol, but to integrate the symbol into the, the most important discussion about what we are all experiencing together as the changes without, within our societies. And the last factor that we can add to this, which is a recent one, and you, uh, you, you have experiencing it uh, uh, the first place here in the States, is of course violence, extremism, and, and all this discourse now on the potentiality of this Islamic presence being violent. So targeting the West in the States, in uh, uh, Madrid, in London, in other countries. And this is to, to, to say also that this Islamic presence is uh, potentially or could be potentially violent 
and no one can deny the fact that we have to talk about this. We have to talk about this violence and violent extremism as something which is part of this presence as well. But the tiny minority or the marginal presence doing this is having an effect, an impact on all the Muslims and the Muslim persons per se in the West. It's even so much the case that uh, when we speak about violence, very often the discourses that we have in many of the, the, the councils and these conferences that are organized around the world, in the, uh, around the, the West, within the Western countries, are only uh, talking about violence in the West. We talk about what happened in, uh, in uh, New York, in London, in Madrid. But what about Amman? What about Bali? What about Iraq? What about Afghanistan? It's as if there are two, two, two ways of tackling this violence coming from Muslims. When it's within the Muslim majority countries, it's their business. But when it's here, it's our business. This is where they are uh, dangerous. It may be sometimes that the violence that we have there, it's also the consequence of some policies that we have here. And, and in which we, it doesn't mean that we are justifying, but we try to understand what is happening in Muslim majority countries. So four factors that are very important. To understand that we need to, to, to get a sense of the whole discussion. To get the causes of these fears and also mistrust that we have within the society. It's important in order to be able to deal with our fellow citizens and to deal uh, within the society in something which is a constructive discussion. So to be able to respect the fear because you understand the causes. So this is an attitude, an intellect attitude, which is important. And in campuses, in universities, in our societies, if we are talking about civil society, this respect, this understanding of the causes, what is happening, should help us to get a deeper discussion by respecting the fear and trying to answer some of the deep questions that are connected. And questioning the Muslim presence is not Islamophobic is legitimate today. It's legitimate to question the Muslims uh, about their presence, what do they want, what are their expectations. It's legitimate because all what you get from the media and the coverage is problematic, is controversial. So this constructive dialogue coming from understanding the causes, it's important. And it should be in our universities that these discussions should, uh, uh, must start. It's really important for us not to avoid this discussion. And I'm sometimes a bit uh, uh, concerned about the fact that uh, there is no discussion in the civil society, but there is no critical discussion within our universities. It's as if you, we study the problem, but we are not here to come with an input within the society. And I don't want, this is not the way I see, this is what you, you said by saying I'm working at two different levels, I don't want you know, the universities to be ivory towers where the people are thinking about the world and not connecting themselves with the world. So this is a responsibility for students to understand and to spread around something which is a more constructive take on all these emotional discussions that we have within our societies. Uh, and if anything, this is the job of universities to uh, transform or tr translate into rational discussion something which is sometimes very emotional and controversial in our uh, uh, public discourse. So, to respect this fear, to understand this fear, to respect this uh, 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 sense of insecurity within the society, but at the same time to be able to face and to resist any kind of instrumentalization of this fear. Because this is where we are in danger. We know that this is the way it works. With all the very powerful media that we have now, it's very easy to instrumentalize emotional uh, uh, emotions and fear. This is what I call emotional politics. And this is uh, the populist uh, trend that we have, or the discourse that was coming uh, with the Bush administration or the Tea Party that you have in your country today, which are quite worrying, to say the least. Because I, I, I think that this is where we, we, we need to understand, if we are not able to respect the fear of our fellow citizens, we are not going to be able to resist its instrumentalization. It's, it's, if you deny this, it's going to be used there. But you have to respect this to understand and to come with the, the, the facts and the figures helping the people to, to get a, a better sense of what is happening and then with a better understanding they are able to resist any kind of in, uh, political instrumentalization. So having said that now, 
uh, let us come to beyond the perceptions, beyond uh, what is said about this problematic Muslim presence in the West. And this is what I'm trying to translate uh, into the book. Whatever the societies, even uh, the, the new, what we call, you know, the, the new Muslim presence in some of the European countries, for example, uh, uh, last uh, Sunday we were with Jan Burma and uh, Olivier Roy, we had a, a discussion in, in Italy. And Italy is a country where we are just reaching now the second generation of Muslim presence, compared to France, which is now reaching the fifth generation of Muslim presence. So it's not all the same. We have different pace and, and rhythm and, and reality. And still, what uh, I, the, the, the people that I'm meeting and the Muslims, the Italian Muslims that I'm meeting, of course they are going faster than what was the reality of the French or the British Muslims. Why? Because they are gaining from their experience and understanding better in which way they can be European Muslims. And you can see now with the second generation of Italian Muslims a better understanding of you know, who we are and in which way we respond. And if you look at the Canadian experience, at the, uh, at the American experience, and when I'm speaking about the American experience, I'm not only speaking about uh, the immigrant experience, but also the African-American experience, which is also quite important. Because this is a very interesting uh, case study, where you have people uh, who, some of them converted to Islam, some of them were Muslims, and they don't want to translate their Islamic or Muslim presence into something which is the immigrant factor. Because we don't talk about immigration and uh, integration to the African American. We also have this problem with people who are converting to Islam in the West, and we have more and more people converting to Islam, and we put them in a box which is, oh, what about integration? We say, what do we want me to integrate? Because I am a European. Um, uh, uh, so you, you by definition think that Islam is not a European religion, that uh, Islam has to integrate, while my culture, my identity is to be a European. I'm a French, I'm a British. So it's quite interesting not only to, to, to get this discussion into when we speak about Islam, we speak about integration uh, or cultural integration. Another perspective is also in interesting for us when we, we live in, in, in Europe, is also to be able in Europe to speak not only about Western European countries, but Eastern European countries. Because if you listen to the Mufti of Sarajevo, Mustafa Cheric, and say, look, you are asking me to be a European and to talk to you about being a European. We have been Europeans maybe even before many of you. Our presence here is, you know, centuries of Muslim presence in the Balkan. And now you are coming to ask us to justify that we are European. We might have to ask you the same question. Who gave you the right to ask us this question? From which position? And this is a very important point. Never forget that. Because at the end of the day, they are able to ask the question out of an economic power. It's about power. It's not about, you know, a cultural discussion. It's because the Western Europe, it's more uh, economically developed and industrialized that it's patronizing about, you know, the reality of this diversity. And this is something that we have uh, to keep in mind in all our discussion. When you speak about integration, when we speak about diversity, always ask the one who is talking about it from where he or she speaks. A position of weakness or a position of power. Economic power or political power. I think it's quite important, and this is something which is a very in important dimension of our discussion. And by studying the African American, uh, the, 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 the black resistance in many of the countries, and everything which has to do with the racial uh, uh, framework, is something that we can keep in mind in all this discussion. And don't put the discussion around Islam outside this reality of uh, the power struggle and who is talking and from where he or she is talking. So, understanding these causes, understanding the framework and why we are experiencing this and, and what other causes are important. And the second stage is really to go beyond this discussion about integration. If we, spoke, we speak about immigrants or if we speak about people who are, have been here for centuries and they are Americans or they are Canadians or they are uh, Europeans, there is one thing which is important beyond the perception is really why are we 
able to say that we have now to move beyond all this integration business and this discussion about integration. Even though uh, for the immigrants to speak about integration was, you know, a progressive take 30 or 40 years ago, it was. It was where the people were saying we have to, to push for integration, uh, equal rights and all that. It's as if we are not moving from this uh, first uh, uh, stage of our discussion with the first wave of immigrants. But now, if you look at the Western Muslims, and this is why I'm saying from there we can get a very deep sense of belonging, which is beyond only the rules. They are getting what I call in the book the three L's. The three L's. First, crossing the board, all the countries from Canada to Australia and with all the European uh, countries, the Muslims as citizens abide by the law of the country. And the mainstream discourse is to acknowledge the fact that the law of the country are your law. It's the legal framework that you respect. If you look at all the Muslim organizations, the mainstream Muslim organization from the beginning, you may, it's, it doesn't mean that we are happy with all the law. And more importantly, it doesn't mean that we are happy with the way the law are implemented. Because the problem is not sometimes the law, the, the problem is the way they are implemented. The, you know, the law are telling us we are all equal before law. But in some situations, when you are black and when you are Arab and when you are Muslims, some are more equal than others, as you know. So this is the reality, it's implementation. But we abide by the law, one. The second is crossing the border. And even, as I told you, in a very young country as to the Muslim presence, like uh, such as Italy and Spain, they get the language of the country, the good comment, the language of the country, which is very important. If we are talking about being part of a society, it's not only to get the language to communicate, it's to get the language because you cannot be a ton, an autonomous citizen if you don't get the language of the country. Language is power. Language is power and the, the, the status of being a citizen has to do with power, has to do with this autonomous being dealing with his rights or her rights and his duties or her duties. So this is an important point. The language is important. And this is a discussion that I had with Olivier Roy. He was saying the only thing on which we, sh we could objectively agree, and on this he is right, but I would say not completely. I don't completely agree with him. He's saying, let us say, as soon as you abide by the law, it's enough. You abide by the law of the country. And I would say that's fine from a, a legal perspective, an objective perspective, that we abide by the law, and very often we are asked to do, to do so. But I would say that you can't only speak about the legal framework, not understanding for this legal framework to be implemented in the right way, you have to add other factors. One of them is really for you, not only to know, to respect the law, but to be able to get the language through which these laws are going to be implemented and the language of the country, it's important. The third one is loyalty. And loyalty, it's important. This is the questions that we had for uh, years in Europe. Are you first a Muslim or are you first a British or a French or a Swiss? And you get, it's a very simple question, but it's a very smart question. And at the same time, a silly question. Because it's a smart question because it puts you in a situation where if you think with your mind, you may be nuanced. But if you think with your emotion, it depends where you are in the society, you are going to give an answer which is going to prove the point of the, the one who is asking you the question. So if you are, for example, in France, just after the football match between Algeria and France, <laughs> you remember that? I was for Egypt, anyway. The question came because the French, uh, uh, mainly Arabs coming from Algeria, just after the match, were asked, why are you first? What would you expect from a young French having the feeling that in this, in this society he or she is not respected and he came to support the Algerian team just to show to the French people how much Algeria matters? Are you going to expect him or her to answer? I'm a French. They were to answer emotionally Algerian or Muslim. And this is an emotional answer to a very 
a smart question. It's a, it was a trap. And you can play with this. But in fact, behind this question, there is one deeper question, which is not only who you are first, but to what are you loyal? Where lies your loyalty? Do you want the best for France, or are you only a Muslim, or an Arab, or an Algerian? And behind this discussion about the identity is really a question, can I trust you? Are you not only in a position of weakness as a minority, and when you will be a majority, you will take over, and it will be finished with us? You laugh, but one of the students that I met in Italy is writing a, 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 a master's, and he was telling me, my uh, supervisor is telling me, I want you to respond to one question. What are the expectations of Muslims the day they are going to be in majority? So the point is, first, one day the Muslims are going to be in majority. This is an assumption about the, the future of Europe. And then it might be that, that what they are saying as a minority is not what they are going to say as a majority. They want to change the whole thing. Are they going to implement Sharia? Are they going to impose the Islamic rules? So if you have this in mind, how can you trust your fellow citizen coming from uh, or having an Islamic background or coming from uh, another country? So I think that this is where you go and you try to get from these perceptions about the mistrust on the loyalty to what is said by the leaders and the Muslims and the evolution over the last 30 years. And you get the sense that now all this discussion about being a citizen, uh, doing the best for the country, uh, feeling that you are Canadian or American or uh, European is to be loyal to the country and to share views and, and, and values and, and understanding that this is the common future. Of course, the first generation of immigrants, when they came, they thought they would go back home. They would go back home. And now they, they are in France or in Germany or in Canada or in the States. And add to this the reality of the native or the indigenous, so to speak, uh, people who converted to Islam, who have nothing to do with integration and immigration. They think about the future of their country. Our kids are going to be raised, born and raised here. So this is something which is the loyalty towards the country. It's a very important point. Three L's. If you look now at facts and figures, and the Gallup, for example, survey that we had, or the Pew survey that we have, all the figures are showing in the book of uh, John Esposito uh, about uh, uh, you know, what the Muslims are expecting. It was done also uh, uh, through the Gallup uh, uh, survey. Uh, all the figures are showing that the Western Muslims, Canadian, American, European, Australian, they are loyal to the country and they want the best for their country. So they feel that they are British, German, American. Uh, of course, in times of crisis, sometimes you are referring to your countries of origin. But the point is that the feeling and the, uh, the, 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 the way they are assertive is now the third L is there. So the three L's are important, not only to come with something which is, OK, I got the status of being a citizen. But beyond citizenship, there is something which is a psychological factor. And the psychological factor, I feel good at home with the language. I know how to express myself. And then I belong to, the, to this country because I want the best for this country. So the objective factor, the psychological factor, and the hope factor. It's I want the best for this country. Being able to say something that we have, for example, in our uh, Islamic tradition, to be able to, to look at the people around you and to say, as we have it in Arabic, Ya qawmi my people. My people doesn't mean that uh, I agree with you or I'm completely, no. It means that I am even struggling for my rights or for justice within this country because I want the best for this country. So it's really to put my struggle here because I feel that I'm part of this. Which is a very important, uh, uh, you know, uh, experience from a religious viewpoint. From Moses to Jesus to uh, Muhammad peace be upon all of the, 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 the prophet, there is something here which is very important. And all this, they might have been rejected by the people, but they were always saying, my people. So your rejection is not putting me outside. Your rejection is our problem. It's not your problem. It's my problem. 
it's our problem. And this is something which is a very important point. And we are facing with, you know, all the struggle for uh, uh, racial rights and, and equality and, and women and men and black and, and white. All this discussion, everything which has to do with this struggle within the society should let the people understand, don't put me outside the box. Don't put me outside the society. So it might be that the West has a problem with the Islamic presence, but Islam is a Western religion. It's within. It's not outside. And all the Muslims who are accepting the paradigm that is put on her, uh, on them, that they are outside, are playing the game of you know, this fracture between us and them. So this is why we have sometimes to come to talk about the narrative. By the way, the next book that I want to write is about this, the narrative. Who is this us that you are talking about? when you talk about the West and when you talk about our past. You know, a very important point when the Pope, for example, was, on, was tackling the issue of Europe saying, our roots are Greek and Christian. He is relating to a paradigm, to a narrative, which is problematic, but it's in fact reconstructing the past in, answer, in order to answer the present. So scared of this presence of the other that I'm reconstructing the past and the narrative, which is uh, trying to define who we are. And scientifically, he was wrong. But it works when it comes to uh, uh, our discussion today. So the three L's that are so important and, and what we have as facts and figures are showing today that this is a reality, that we have Western Muslims working at that level and that this is uh, uh, something which is real. Does it mean that we have no problems, no. As I told you, uh, we have problems, and many of these problems are coming from uh, an understanding of the, the environment, the understanding of the people around us, the fear, the mistrust, all these problems are there. But it's the way we are putting them which is important. Not from us and them, but us together. It's also uh, to be able, as a Westerner, not only to listen to the question that we have, but to question the questions. This is why when someone is coming to me and tell, asking me, are you first a Muslim or are you first a Swiss? I say, I want to question your question. What do you mean? What do you want to know? And how are you going to reduce me to a very smart question, but as I said, a silly question because I'm many things. So it's important when you are within a society not to put yourself as the alien citizen having to justify themselves to prove that they are citizens. So the power of the question is very important. So to question the question is in power in itself. You say, I might have a problem with your question because I'm not only this. And by the way, I'm a Swiss and I am a Muslim and sometimes I'm first a Swiss and sometimes I'm first a Muslim and sometimes I'm first an Egyptian and sometimes I'm first a, a universalist and sometimes I'm first a European. I'm many things. So to question the question and sometimes to come with an other way of putting the question is something which is part of, of our discussion and, and what I can see today and I am happy with this. When I listen to some of the, the young American Muslims students and, and, and you know, uh, uh, leaders of organizations, men and women, in the States or in, in Europe, it's very interesting to see how now they, 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 they have a better understanding of how it works, the, 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 the language, the, the, the sensitivity, and the way we have to deal with these issues and not to fall into the trap. It starts with something which is very important. It's really to, to get a critical distance with all the controversies that are put for some of the Muslims to fall into the traps. It started with the cartoon issues, for example, the cartoon crisis. Remember that in all the European countries, we didn't have the reactions that we have in Muslim majority countries, because many Muslims in Europe were understanding what was happening. It was a trap. And it was so much the case that when it was repeated by Get Wilders in the Netherlands with his film, uh, his movie Fitna, no reaction. He had to tell the Muslim, thank you for not reacting. Or reacting in such a way. He was thanking them, but he knew how to work with the media. So the Muslims did not react, but he got the first night of this re the, the release of his movie 10 million 
hits in, on, on internet the first night. So he plays with the media while it was not an issue for the Muslims. But he knew how to do that, to play with the fear of the people. And you have lots of people in the United States of America, they are very, very expert on that. They know how to do that. You know, someone, 50 people in Florida, I'm going to burn the Quran. International controversy. But the way the Muslims reacted in the country, great. Understanding that it was a trap, not true, just to take the critical distance, say no. And more importantly, not only to react in a wise way, but to look at the fellow citizens that are understanding in which way this is dangerous for all of us, us as Americans, us as human beings, and not only us as Muslims. So to shift the, 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 the discussion into something which is, no, it's not against Islam, it's against humanity and dignity. And you shift this, and this is something which is also part of an evolution that we can see in the West. It's a very important one. Let me come to what also now are uh, things that we can see and, and they are expected from Muslims just going to, uh, before going to my conclusion. We are dealing with all this with a great deal of ignorance, but not only. So all the people who are saying, you know what, the problem with the fellow citizens or, or the society is that there is a great deal of ignorance. That's true. Many people, they don't know enough about Islam. And, and, and today, to tell you the truth, even many Muslims don't know enough about Islam. So there is, we need more education, more education about something which is simple to say and very deep to, to get, the complexity of the Islamic reference. Islam is as complex as Christianity. They are trans, they have different understandings, different interpretations. It's very important to get this complexity. And sometimes I don't want my fellow citizens to know more about Islam or to know everything about Islam, but have just this sense of complexity. It's complex. Because when you get that it's complex, you have something in you which is so important for our future. There will be no pluralistic society. Whatever is the model that you have, multiculturalism or the secular French, I don't care about all these words. I, the only thing that I objectively know is that our future is to get pluralistic societies. People coming from different backgrounds, coming from, without, you know, a loaded term as multiculturalism, because some are saying it's the failure of the multicultural system. I don't, I don't get that. I don't, I don't want to fall into this discussion, uh, uh, which for me it's a trap. Or, the, the, the point really is this one. How are we going to get this pluralistic society? For me, as citizens and human beings, we will never succeed in promoting multicultural or uh, pluralistic society, or uh, this multiple dimension within our society, without humility. You that a sense of humility, intellectual humility, which is also an intellectual modesty, which is a way you look at things and for me, it's important. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with uh, spirituality or, or, or being religious. You can be an atheist and have this very, very deep intellectual humility. And you can be a believer and be intellectually arrogant. It doesn't mean because you are humble with your heart that you are not arrogant with your mind. And sometimes some are confusing. They, they might be humble with their heart and very arrogant in the way they judge people. But why I'm saying this is that it's very important for the people to get a sense that Islam is complex and the Muslims are a co complex communities. With this complexity, you get this humility. And with humility, it's possible to get a better sense. So it's a mindset, it's a, an attitude that you may have with your mind, which is so important. That's even before starting the discussion and the dialogue. And this, it's important to get a sense of what the, 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 the Muslims as uh, uh, citizens also should do today. And what I believe is really this, that when I'm, I'm uh, traveling around and meeting with leaders in Muslim communities, my sense is really that uh, we have a, a great deal of work to do and to work from within the Muslim community. To nurture the, the three L's and to go beyond this and to get from what was called integration to contribution. In fact, to be an active presence in the society, to contribute. So this is the key word for me. 
I don't want anyone to tell me you have to integrate. That's over and millions are showing that it's done. We don't have this problem now. The discussion will continue, of course, because we will have immigrants coming, of course. It will have people coming uh, with, you know, their culture and, 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 and sometimes tensions, of course. But the Muslims that are Western Muslims now, who are Western Muslims now, should help in the process of helping these newcomers. And this is where it's important. Today, it's the other way around. We are using the newcomers to set suspicion on the citizens. Because we see behaviors in the newcomers and say, okay, look, this is Islam. So you are like them. While we should do this, the opposite, use the citizens that we have to help the newcomers understand how it works here. So this is where the Muslims should be involved in a self-critical assessment of where they are in the discussion. There is one very important problem. And this is why I, I translated in the book in the seven C's that are needed. And by speaking about the seven C's that the Muslims need, I would say that uh, all my fellow citizens, all the people that I'm meeting uh, everywhere, they also need the seven C's. And the first one, as opposed to the, the, the fear of the beginning of this discussion, is confidence. Is confidence. My problem very often is not that the problem that the, the, my fellow citizens doesn't, don't know Islam. Very often I have a problem with them because they don't know who they are. They don't know their, their own tradition. They don't have a sense of history. And this is something which is undermining everything in the West. When you are teaching your students to be efficient in the, the market and in anything which has to do with you know, uh, performance in, 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 in business, and not getting a sense of history and where do you, who do you are with your culture, of course is going to be a problem when you meet people with another culture, with other references. I'm putting very simple. If you don't know who you are, you are going to be scared of who you are not. It's as simple as that. It's basic psychology. So people coming with, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be religious. It, it, it means for, if you are an atheist or agnostic, uh, a non-Christian uh, that you are refusing Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism or Hindu, Hinduism, at least to know what you are talking about, to get the knowledge. So there is something which has to do with confidence, self-confidence. And if you go to Muslim communities, this is something which is so important, to stop to be def on the defensive, to stop to be uh, uh, apologizing, or I'm a good Muslim, or to accept these words that are so problematic, I'm a moderate. So what do you mean? Define moderation. Because, very, you know, the way you put moderate in your mouth is not the way it's understood by some politicians in this country. If you listen to Daniel Pipes, the only moderate Muslims are the ex-Muslims. This is what he's saying. So, you have to know, you have to define the words that you are using. So confidence is important. And with confidence, it's the way you are communicating. This is the second C, communicating, to be able to communicate. Language is important, and communicate is also to set uh, the scene, to be able for you to decide what are the priorities and not to let the people decide for you. That you may have to say, no, I don't want to ask this question. This question is not my question. It's not my concern. It might be yours, but I have other questions to ask. For example, when you have politicians, when it comes to what is happening in the suburbs or what is happening in this country, they are culturalizing or rationalizing the discussion. Say, this is not the problem, it's about social justice. It's, we are talking about justice here, we're not talking about you know, the fact that there are Arabs and Muslims. But you talk about the fact that there are Arabs and Muslims because you don't want to talk about your policies that are unjust. So this is where you come with communication. And communication, as I said, is also power. And to be able to speak about this. I, I like Chandra Muzaffar from Malaysia. I say, uh, are, we have two problems today. The first one is that we are obsessed with Islam and the West. And in fact, it's already old, an old story. Now we have to look at the shift between the West and the East. Because something is happening in China and something is happening in India, so we have to change our paradigm. And the second is all this discussion about alliance of civilization, a discussion and dialogue. It's as if we are not talking about power. We are talking about injustice, the South and the North. It's still there. 
It's not because you speak about my color that I don't know that uh, you may have a problem with, you know, power and who is leading, even in the discussion within our society. So this is something which is the second C about communication. The third uh, C, which is also important in our discussion, is consistency. And this, is, this has to do with critical thinking. Consistency is to be able, from within the Muslim communities, to look at what we are doing and to say, Islam might be a great religion, but what all the Muslims are doing is great. So to be critical. And to do it from within. And this is where today the Western Muslims are facing a very critical discussion, a very critical challenge, which is the intra-community dialogue the lack of dialogue between trends and cultures and histories. For example, in your country, I have been saying this for, you know, my first encounter with, uh, with Islam in America has nothing to do with immigration. I was introduced to Islam in America through Malcolm X, through the African American. This, this is the experience that I got. And I got something which has compl was completely different from what I got afterward when I came and I, I, I was dealing with, with uh, the immigrants and the way they were looking at America. The narrative was different, the perception was different, the understanding was different. And it's still different, but there is no, not enough communication. Not enough communication between the Shia and the Sunni, not co enough communication between the history within and understanding even uh, what is happening. And this is the same in, in Europe. So, Consistency and critical thinking, it's important. Creativity. Creativity means uh, uh, something which is to come with new uh, vision for the future, which is also missing, in which we today, as American Muslims, we fit into the whole discussion. My assistant, Muna, is here, and she was upset with me when, in the discussion about the, the community center, I was not enough creative. She might be right, she might be wrong. Uh, this is the, 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 the discussion that we have, but the, the point is that creative in the way we are looking at the challenges within the society and to come with other way of dealing with this. Creativity is important. Contribution, as I said, it's also important. And also something which has to do with power, as I told you, is within the society as citizens, the way to contest, the way to say no. The, the, the right to say no and to be really part of the discussion, to say, no, I don't agree. But not to accept, because we don't agree to see our loyalty questioned. And this is something which is important. I may say no, but this is because I'm in, because this is my society. So I'm able to say no, I'm able to struggle for my rights or to struggle for my thoughts within the society. And the last one, which is uh, uh, something which is a spiritual dimension at the same time, is uh, a kind of uh, an attitude which is missing among ourselves, which is what I call compassion. It's not only forgiveness, it's, it's something which is uh, a kind of understanding uh, uh, what, what I translated before in intellectual empathy. I don't have time to go for that, but these are the seven C's that I think, if you listen, uh, if you look at what is happening within the communities, uh, these are things that we have to push in one way or in another uh, and to promote with, within the Muslim communities, but also uh, from outside. And my conclusion with all that is really to, uh, um, to come to... Uh, a point where if you look at what is happening today in the West and you go, as I try to do today, beyond the perception and you look at what is happening, that we are very much beyond the integration uh, process, that now we have a, a Western religion. Islam is a Western religion and the citizens are here, they abide by the law, they speak the language, they are loyal to the country and they want the best is really to ask ourselves how do we fit into the discussions at the national level at, and at the international level. Uh, taking into account the fact that we have political forces that are going to use this fear to try to win the next election and it is now international. So there are things that we have to refuse but they have things that we have to propose. To refuse what I call this culturalization of the Muslim presence and the religionizing of the whole discussion about the fact that you are coming from Islam and this is why, this is the way we are going to explain your problem. The problem is that you are Muslim. 
or the problem is that you are coming from an Arab country. And today, the shift between being an Arab and being a Muslim and this perception that you are the other is very deep. Is very deep. Uh, uh, I heard recently uh, German Jackson, Professor Jackson, speaking about this, saying it was quite interesting to see that the people who were talking against uh, uh, the President Barack Obama was not referring to the fact that he was African American, but they were saying he's an Arab, as if it's a new category which is problematic. And I think he's right. He's right even in, the, in Europe. This is the problem. The problem is uh, within the American narrative to say you are an African American means you are one of us. But to say you are an Arab, oh, pushing you outside. And it's exactly the same in, in Europe. When you are perceived as an Arab, you are outside. So if you connect Islam with being an Arab, it's the religion of the other. It's all this discussion that we had in Europe. It's how we built the European identity with us versus them. And them are mainly the Muslims or the Arab, or the people coming from Africa. Because this was the limitation with the Mediterranean Sea. This was the perception and the whole construction. This is why when now we are within, when you are a Westerner, to deconstruct this discourse, but to propose a shift into something which is uh, a better understanding of what are the challenges at stake. Let me just end with this. When you study the, the, the uh, you know, very often we speak about uh, uh, the reality of uh, Martin Luther King in the country by struggling for the rights of the, the, the black people, but being able to connect this to the values of all universal values helping a specific struggle not to accept the box in fact if you come to something which is a very important journey with Malcolm X Malcolm X at the beginning he was with the nation of Islam and this was our values and our race it's be black against the white narrative and often we come and say, oh, he came back to the true Islam during the last two years of his life, after he went to pilgrimage. He came with a better understanding that there is something wrong in all his understanding. It's not a black discussion. It's a question about justice, even though he never, never dismissed the point that there is something with the fact of being black. He never said that. But he understood that the shift into the values and the struggle, it's not on the fact that you are denying the reality that the white don't like the black, but it might be that the black should not fall into the trap to put themselves as black against white. A shift, which is coming to the universal values that may be common and to shift, to, to change the fracture zone between us and them, and to say it's not this. He came back, and guess what? He didn't come and say, hello, white people who are going to work together. He went to Africa. And with African, he understood there is something which is beyond the national struggle. Because the problem of the black people in Africa was not resisting the white in the state. It was the black resistance in Africa it's about the injustice they were facing there. So it's the system which is problematic, it's not the color. But the color is using the system to make you avoid the system and to speak about color. So he changed, the sh he shifted this. I said, this I don't want to be put in this box. I will change this. So it's to change that. And I would say that the American Muslims, the European Muslims should do exactly the same to try to find the universal take of the values in which or through which they look at their struggles to accept that there is something which is called racism. Yes, there is racism. Yes, there is xenophobia. Yes, there is Islamophobia. But I'm not going to fall into the trap of putting an us into something which is crossing the board with the values. So a universal take in specific struggles. And I would say that this is where we can create a new we 
a new we meaning it's not a question of Muslims and non-Muslims. It's not a question of black, black and white. It's a question of you will find a we in the white people understanding that there are discrimination and they will be end on the side of the struggle for or against racism. And you will find exactly the same on social justice and all these dimensions that are so important. So it's too simple to say that Malcolm X came to the true Islam. He came to something which is very deep and very, very interesting in his whole understanding of what are the terms of the struggle. And I'm not going to accept that you decide for me the terms of the struggle. Because if you decide for me, I have already lost. Because the way you put it is not the, go the way I'm going to win the whole struggle. And I would say that for all of us, this to end with this discussion on power, it's not to be obsessed with power, but to understand in which way this reality of being Western Muslims, of uh, being involved in the society, and to belong to this society, to want the, the best for this society, is really this contribution, this intellectual contribution to in which way we have to reform these societies for the better, for more justice, for more understanding, and once again, for a dialogue on an equal footing which is exactly what I think should be a pluralistic society. Thank you. Thank you. We have an opportunity for uh, discussion at this point. Happy to recognize. Yeah, please, right here. Yes, I heard these voices, uh, not only in, in the Netherlands, but we, we had them in Britain, had a, an Islamic party in Britain, an Islamic party in, in Belgium. Uh, or they were thinking about organizing a, a kind of a, a, a movement from within the society. And I would say that these uh, attempts or, or this understanding is really showing a lack of understanding of how it works within the society. It's, it's exactly the opposite of what should be done, I think. Because if you understand the way it works, it's not by, uh, within the Netherlands, for example, just to try to create a, a party for the Muslims and the Arabs or the European Arab, and, and they get less than one or, or one and a half percent of the votes, and, and the people uh, are not going to follow this. And I would say it's wrong to push the Muslims to uh, put themselves into something which is uh, uh, 
exactly the opposite of exactly what I was saying. It's, it's as if we are going from a vision of the second Malcolm X to the first one, which is a closed reality, a closed movement. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, we should go on the other side without thinking about in which way we are involved in politics. Because for me, when I was asked about this in France or, or in Britain or even here in, in the States and in Canada, I say, be involved in politics, of course, we need to have voices in the political landscape. But what should be the meaning of your presence? Is to do politics as the other? Is to come with, I'm defending my interests as a minority? Or should you be present or active or contributing in the political discourse with something which is different? This is what I call normalizing our political presence without trivializing it. Not to do as the others. Meaning by this that if I enter in, you know, many of what I'm doing as a public you know, intellectual is politics. You talk about politics, but it's to, 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 to just to remind the people of what? Principles, justice, you know, for all. It's to come with this understanding. It's to be able, as a, a Dutch Muslim, to enter in politics and to stop talking about Islam, and to speak, to speak about the educational system, to speak about social justice, to speak about women, to speak about you know, the people who are disabled in the society, to speak about immigration and not to enter in politics for your interest. This is exactly what the people are doing. You enter for the interest of your color or your religion, others are entering for the interest of their money. That's it. They want the money, they want just to, the, the justice for you. So no, no specific interest. It's something that has to be deeper, more universal. This is where I would like to see the citizens being involved uh, and, and to normalize the presence means exactly the opposite. To be part is to be able to be a citizen, to let the people forget your religion while your principles are everywhere in what you are doing. So your principles as, you know, being consistent, being just, being fair, being serving the people. This is what it means to be a Muslim. It means the same to be a Christian. It means the same to be a Jew. It means the same to be a Buddhist. You have your ethics. And you come with this, and you show this for all, without you know uh, being a, a, a sectarian or, or creating a sense that every time the Muslims are speaking is about Islam. They care only when the Muslims are victims. They are able, and by the way, it was not true, but the perception is, when something is happening in Pakistan, they are there. When it's something in Haiti, they are not there. I think that uh, when I'm talking to the American government by saying the blood of an Afghani civilian is as valuable as the blood of an American civilian, I should see from the Muslims exactly the same thing, that the blood of an American or the reality of injustice in America for people who are not Muslims is the same problem that for uh, when it comes to, non to Muslims. This is why we have to, this is the way I would say we have to be differ different in our understanding. So I would go exactly the opposite than this trend. I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a trap. Uh, it's really an, at an attitude which is coming from people who don't understand what is happening in, in, uh, in the West today. I think it's dangerous. Right back here, please. Is it 
that fear real? And is, is the real issue of reciprocity? Why isn't there uh, reciprocity in Muslim lands for the freedoms we grant? And it seems to me that some who are comfortable with that situation, when they come to America, they're, they're offended with the slightest uh, imposition or question, but they were enablers of it on the other side. <laughs> it, it, it not only it's a real fear, but it's a, it's a legitimate question. You are asking a legitimate question. I, I don't agree with the way you put it, but understand what you are trying to say. And I will question the question, but at the same time come to your position uh, by trying to be consistent. Because the point here is really to be consistent. What is a reality is that for the Muslims coming to the West for the first generations of this, you know, presence, and now being Muslims, a Western Muslims, that's true that they they are free to practice and that the fundamental rights of, you know, freedom of conscience and freedom of worship, freedom of conscience being the individual right, and freedom of worship the community right to practice and to get, you know, a, a mosque. These uh, are two rights that are mainly protected in all the Western society. Even though we have problems, you know, even in all the discussion that you had in the community center, you had people like the, the mayor of, of uh, uh, even the president was saying, these are principles, indisputable principles of our uh, uh, nation in the States. And it, uh, we had the same in, uh, um, in Europe, even though sometimes it's very difficult to build a mosque. And, and you have in, in this country now, I think, 26 mosques that are prevented from being built because of, you know, people they don't want and they are using this fear of this Islamization or uh, other uh, admi administrative issues. But the great, the majority, the, the reality is that the principles are here and there is something which is, it's possible. And if we are talking about the evolution of the Muslim presence over the last 30 years in the West, that's true. Lots of mosques, lots of centers, no one can deny this. You go to Muslim majority countries now and no one can deny the fact that in some Muslim majority countries there are discriminations. There are problems for the minorities. And once again, 20 years ago when I, I was writing a, 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 a book with a, um, a Christian uh, professor, uh, Jacques Nerinck, we had a discussion on this and he was asking me about Saudi Arabia, for example, and you mentioned Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, there is one prophetic tradition saying that this, in the peninsula, there will be no, uh, there will be, never be two religions, and they are using this to say no churches and, and nothing. You can understand that in Mecca, in, you know, which is a, a big mosque, it's a, in fact a sacred place, you don't have a church. But when you are inviting workers, when you are inviting people to work in the country, and you prevent them even from practicing, it's problematic. And if you have, you know, in some uh, countries, yes, discriminations, you have to take a stand by saying no. There is a difference between the presence and between evangelizing, it's trying to convert. My take on this is that no one has to try to convert people. You just have to be a witness of your faith. I don't like this mi missionary business of going and try to convert the people. I didn't like under colonization. I don't like when it's Christian. I don't like when it's Muslim. I don't like the Muslims trying to convert the people. It's not of your business. This is between you and God. Sorry? That's fine. We have two different positions. That the, or, no, the only thing for me, the only thing which for me it's, it's important is when you are a Christian and when you are a Muslim and when you are a Jew or a Buddhist, just try to be the witness of your principles in your way of life. Be a witness. But don't try to convert the heart. No, 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 no. This is the way I see it. You have another vision on that. You don't mind being for people trying to convert you, and you don't mind trying to convert them. That's a vision of uh, what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a Muslim. But that's fine. Having said that now, my position would not be on, on the right to, to, to convert the people, but at least behind what you are saying, to express oneself, to be able to say, I'm a Christian, and, to, and we have a problem in many Muslim-majority countries. Now, let us come to try to find a solution to this in our way of living together. Don't come to your fellow Muslim American citizens by telling them, because you don't have, we don't have the rights over there, we're not going to give you the rights here. 
Because human rights and principles are not matter of trade. We don't, you give, or no. And first of all, these people or these regimes there, that mainly the great majority of them are uh, dictatorships, but not all of them, they are not our masters. They, they, they are not teaching us how to be. We have to stick to principles. So I would say this rep reciprocity discussion that I always have uh, in the interfaith dialogue is problematic by, because I am here in the West, because I try just to avoid the, the you know, to, to flee the, 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 the autocratic regimes there. And when I'm in the West, I'm asked about what are you doing there? I say, it's not me. <laughs> it's them. But you have one right, and I have one duty. The right is to ask me my moral stand on that. Not to, not to give me my rights here, because rights are rights and we have to protect them, whatever is done by people. I don't care about what the, 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 the Muslim majority country are doing here. Here we have to protect the rights of the people and not to come with trade. It's human dignity and human rights. But my moral duty is to stand up and to say, that's not right. Discriminations against any kind of religious belief in Muslim majority countries, this is not right. This is my moral duty. But I'm not going to accept to be the victim of not getting my rights here because of what they are doing there. I have the moral right to speak, but you have the moral duty to implement the rights here and us together. Now you're asking another question, which is the best model. I don't know because I really don't think that there is a model today. Every single society we have to struggle for. They are all calling about, you know, and speaking about the fact that Islam is respectful towards the other, but we are all facing wrong implementation and uh, partial implementation and sometimes discrimination. And I would say that today if I'm asked about the West, which is the best country where the religious rights are uh, uh, protected, I would say they are all struggling to get it better because we are all facing discriminations in the way it's implemented. So this discussion about reciprocity is an important one, but I wouldn't put it that way. I, I would put it uh, in the way that uh, um, we stick to our principles and to ask our fellow citizens to be clear on what is their take on freedom of uh, religion in the Muslim majority countries, this is the least that they can do. Yes, I, I think this is exactly what I was trying to say uh, with my conclusion. We need to find a way of being here and, and uh, struggling uh, for a better understanding, mutual respect and the rights of the citizens. How can we do this? And this is where sometimes I'm not always expressing myself the right way or understood the right way by my fellow Muslims in the West. Because I will never accept to give up on our rights and our dignity. And this is why, by the way, I am facing so many problems in many European countries and even here. You know, saying that uh, I, I don't know why I have been banned from here exactly. It's maybe that uh, because of my position on Iraq and, and Palestine. But I got other things coming from the State Department telling me it's what you are saying to the Muslims as citizens. And some other were saying, because you are critical of the, the economic system. I don't know the exact reason, even though I am quite sure that it's uh, based on, on my criticism towards you know, the war in Iraq and, and the unilateral support of uh, Israel from the states, why I think that you cannot promote a peace process if you are not serious about the rights of the Palestinians. So this is my, 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 my position. But there is something here which is uh, an important uh, uh, point for me in the West is 
not to accept, to give up on rights, and at the same time to get a sense of the whole picture, a comprehensive approach. Because you are dealing with political forces and people who know you quite well. You think that they are all ignorant? No, many of your fellow citizens, they don't know about Islam. But you are dealing with politicians, they know exactly how it works with Muslims. Because they have a very long experience. You know the American administration doesn't know how the Muslims are reacting in Muslim-majority countries? It's, it's 70 years that they, they know, you know how to deal with them. And Britain and France, very long experience. And they know how much emotional the Muslims could be. And how you can attract them in one direction while the problem is elsewhere. So this attitude of being, you know, what I called in the cartoon crisis, a critical distance, an intellectual distance. Take time to, to look at the whole picture. Who is playing what? Because sometimes, you know, it's very dangerous. Because you think that there, you are dealing with your government, your direct government, the United States of America, and you see how it went, for example, in Denmark, is that the government was in alliance with other governments in the Muslim-majority countries, and you are trapped in between. You think you deal with one, and they are dealing together. Because some, they are quite interested in the fact that you can be mistrusted in the country, in Muslim-majority countries. So you are in between, and you have to get a, a sense of all this discussion together. And to step back and to try to find the best attitude, consistent and intelligent for the society. And there are three things for me that are quite important. The first one is uh, to know what are the priorities. What do we want to achieve in this society? So this is what I was saying about this contribution and talking about justice and, and being able to come with this. The second is never forget your rights, but understand in which way you have to contribute and your obligations towards the society. And this is why, for me, all this discussion about the center and, and, and sometimes to be pushed on, on, you know, many people think that because you are reacting in a vocal way, it shows that you are strong. But it might be the opposite, that you have been pushed to react on something, and because you, have, you did not decide why you are reacting, you are in a position of weakness while you think that you are strong in the reaction. But the power is in the action, not in the reaction. So I think that this is something which is quite important in the community center. I was looking at the whole story, you're reading and saying, what a trap. What a trap. And many Muslims say, and, and when I was saying, you know, in one of the texts, I was saying, it might be if possible that we remove it. But the people were just li reading one sentence, not getting the whole text, saying we will never give up on our rights. We are, have hope in the system, but we are not going to give up on our rights. But don't put all your attention into a project that could be problematic for the whole system, the, whole, the comprehensive attitude. So it's to come with something which is, I will never accept that, for example, we have Muslim free zones are not, not the possibility to build mosques in the, in the country. But to come with a comprehensive approach by saying there is this, there is this, there is this. You put the priorities and you decide where your struggle should be. It's not always possible because of, of course you have political pressure and you have uh, media coverage which is problematic. But sometimes you can decide to, 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 to what are your priorities and sometimes you get just what I call uh, to look at things from, from far and to try to have a comprehensive approach. And the third thing which is important here, it's uh, what happened in fact, and this was very positive in, after all these uh, 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 controversies here and all this discussion, is not to isolate yourself in the struggle. So sometimes let the non-Muslims say something that the Muslims couldn't be heard if they say that. Let the people who are your fellow citizens say what they, they, because they are saying things that are going to be heard because this, they are saying it. 
I understood after 25 years that on some issues I better keep quiet. Don't speak about this. Let the people speak for you. They are going to be heard. Not because you are shy or because you are uh, scared. Because it's counterproductive. That if you say this, you, not only it's not heard, but it's counterproductive. It is said by your fellow citizen, he will say the same or she will say the same, but from where he or she is, he's going to be heard. So this is crossing the board of, you know, this uh, resistance by saying, but not only in time of controversies, it should be a policy, it should be a vision for the future. Not only when we speak about the community center and to come to me and to send me an email by saying, look, all the people who are supporting us. It's very easy to support you in such a case, contrary to what you think. It's an easy business. Do you want me to give you an example? How many, how many intellectuals and politicians were with us against the, 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 the referendum uh, against the construction of the minarets? We had a list of 10 pages of people coming with us. But just after this, they were put in a bat it doesn't mean that we are not concerned about the women in Islam, about this in Islam, about that in Islam. So they come with a very strong struggle against uh, the minarets because it was easy. It's so silly to be against the construction of minarets that it's easy. It's so silly in the, the narrative of the America to be uh, uh, for the construction of a community center which is not even in Grand Zero, it's far, it's not so close. It's not a big business. It's not on that time that you know who are your allies. It's not that. The time is the allies are who are the people in this country who are serious about human dignity, freedom, justice, no racism, no xenophobia, and to come with a better understanding of what immigration is for the future. And you have to decide this with them. This is an alliance for something and not only against a controversy. And I would say this is the, the most difficult thing to do, but there is no option here. This is the future. Terrific. Those words are a very good place to, uh, to bring this to a close. Thank you everyone for coming. Please join me in thanking.